Hi everyone, welcome back to the operations suite at the Bass Connect Virtual 2021. So we're going to do part two of the inventory control now, which is featuring some of the inventory transactions. My name's Heather Williamson and I'm a senior business consultant here in Western Canada. And I've been working with inventory for many years. <laughs> I'm not even going to tell you how many years, but since I was five. Yeah, back in 1994. So the topics that we're going to cover today include uh, transactions, some transactions, the day end processing uh, provisions, the serial lot tracking uh, and costing, uh, just a high level overview. And then we'll quickly go through the ins and outs of a physical inventory count. Hopefully we'll have time at the end to do a few reports and then uh, that'll be it until we go to the tips and tricks session later on this afternoon. Okay, I'm going to turn off my camera because I'm distracting myself. Okay, so the uh, a copy of the virtual process flow screen is here so that we can see what the process is that Sage recommends. Now in inventory control, it is possible to receive items and ship items. However, these do not integrate with the accounts receivable, accounts payable modules. The transaction totals, just flow through into a clearing account in the GL, and then you can remove it from there using a, a posting of your own. A lot of times people are using inventory on its own or in conjunction with another product, outside product, and that works fine. Today we're gonna to take a look at the transfer inventory options, the adjustments, and the day and processing over here. Uh, we have a couple of other different kinds of, of transactions, which we'll take a look at as we go. All right. Okay. So I'm going to move over to the other screen. And you can see here that I've got my inventory transactions screen up. Uh, if you're having trouble seeing these icons, there should be a little magnifying glass over on the right-hand side of your screen with a plus and minus sign so that you can make the screen larger for your own preference. So I'm going to skip over the receipts and shipments, actually, because we don't really use those so much in here if we're using the full system. I'm going to go right over here to transfers instead. So when you're running multiple locations, then quite often you'll need to transfer stock between locations. And there are a couple of different kinds of transfers. It's just a regular transfer where you pick it up and you move it from one location to another, which is fairly standard. But there's also what we call a transit transfer, where a lot now with the, with the delays and the shipping and everything else, if we're transferring from say Montreal to Vancouver, it's actually more of a transit transfer. And the reason is because we would be looking at our quantities in stock and wondering where that item is. So let's take a look at a regular transfer, for example. Requested quantity. Oh, okay, I haven't done that yet. Here we go. So we're going to transfer from location two to location one. And I just have to make this a little bigger so we can see all the all the fields that it's asking for. <laughs> okay, so uh, the 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 offending person may have requested a certain quantity, but we're only able to ship a certain amount. In which case, the transfer quality quantity won't be ten; it might be six. And then that, if that's the case, then we're going to end up, after this is posted, we're going to end up with a, uh, oops, I have to go from two to one, silly me. 
there we go. They, there's going to be an outstanding amount calculated in here, and this can be uh, transferred later. But for now, I'm just going to put the full amount in. Now you can see at the bottom, it's showing me the quantities for each of these locations, how many are on sales order, how many are on purchase order, how many are actually available. And so, you know, that this is, is thought to be immediate. Okay, so, but the chances of it being transferred immediately from Portland to Seattle, unless somebody drove it up there really fast or flew it up in a very fast jet, it's very unlikely that this would get there in time. So the people will be looking and they'll be, I, I thought we had 262, but we don't. Okay. okay, so I'm gonna just not save this. I'm gonna go in and do what we call a transit transfer. Now what a transit transfer does is it transfers through a tra in transit location. I don't know if you saw, I don't think I showed you all the locations yet, but you'll see that there'll be, uh, multiple locations and then you can have a goods and transit location here you know this is what we would call uh, a, it's not a physical location it's a logical location so therefore we cannot sell quantities out of here uh, but we can transfer and receive into here in and out okay so i'm going to transfer back from portland to it's going to go through the goods and transit location which is coming up automatically and i'm sending it to the seattle location and it's going to see how many am i going to do okay so it's assuming the full amount is going to go through and if i had only been able to transfer so many and there were some left that were requested but not fulfilled, they would show up here in this transfer to date and so on. We also get to see the weights and the unit, units of weights in case we need to price this out for a shipper. Okay, we have a, an additional cost here that we can add. So if we are sending it up by UPS or whatever, we can put that uh, estimate in there. And we can either prorate that out to the items either by cost or by weight, uh, equally between the items, or we can prorate it manually. So I can save this, go and make sure I have what I need, and then I can post it. So it's given me a transfer number two, and I can also print a transfer slip, which I can then put with the product. And of course, if there's seal numbers and lot numbers, I would have had to select that and I can include that on the transfer slip. But these can get quite detailed if you wish. You can put in you know, the, the quantity received in here when you finish. There's a, a few extra things, bells and whistles we can use this for. Okay. So then when the transfer arrives in Seattle, so the nice thing about that was that back when we were looking at the quantities or when the order entry people are doing the, their orders, they will have accurate quantities. We'll be missing 10 items. It won't be in this location. It'll be in the transit location. So if we go here and we do a transit receipt, then we just have to select the transfer number that we created. So you can see now that I have this many on hand, this many available. And then there's my 20 that I have located. Actually, I, I must have done the same item already once. I have in the goods in transit location. So I can receive these. So there's all my, my item details. Quantity outstanding, quantity requested. I can see how much they've transferred to me and how many I've received to date. I think I need to put my glasses on so I can see what I'm doing here. Okay, there's a lot of columns. There we go. <laughs> It automatically assumed that I was going to receive that many. 
So I can put my comments in here. And what we want is for this to be completed. Now, if there were some that were not received, so for example, if I only received eight of the 10 and two went missing somewhere along the line, then we would not want this to complete because we may have to go in and still receive the other two. Okay, I'm gonna post that. I'm not gonna print that now. Okay, so that's your transfers. We also have a, an option called internal usage. This came just in the, the few versions ago. It hasn't been here forever. And this allows us to uh, select uh, some products that we're gonna use internally. We can select if we have payroll, we can select the people that or the person that has out, been allocated this. We can enter the item numbers and uh, the system will calculate the cost, of course, and we can issue a internal usage slip. So this way uh, we can track, you know, marketing and whatever. Um, and there's a, a way of assigning it to the uh, general ledger account accordingly. Now we also have manual adjustments. When we do manual adjustments, what we have to do here is we need to say uh, the, uh, the item, we, we need to say what type of adjustment this is going to be. So is it just the quantity, but the costs are correct? Is it just the cost that's incorrect? Or is it both? So if you're taking an item out of stock, normally you'd be taking both. You'd be putting it in or taking it out with its cost and its quantity. But there are, there are times when we may have made a mistake on the receiving slip and we accidentally put the cost in, but not the right quantity. So now the costs are all wrong and so on. I'm just going to do a both increase just so we can see how that works. And these fields here, the bucket type and the document, this is for when you're using the FIFO costing method, first in, first out. And you have to select which receipt it was that you received it on. Now this is filled in the cost because it knows based on the average what the cost should be for one item. Uh, if we're adjusting the cost, we would have to do the increase or decrease. Okay, I'm just going to post that. I, I always want to say no to deleting transactions. Okay. And there are also uh, assemblies. I'm not going to go into that today. It's, it's a, kind of a whole topic of its own, the bills and materials and the master items and so on. So we're going to go into that uh, another time. Now, in order to be able to print reports and see what we're doing, we do need to have the periodic processing, day and processing run. So I'm just gonna run that because otherwise we don't see the, uh, the costs. We might see the quantities coming in and out, but we don't see the costing and we don't see them on the reports. So you can have day and processing run multiple times throughout the day. It does run the purchase orders first and then the orders. So if you are concerned about you know, negative inventory or whatever, something that's come in and then is shipped on the same day will still be covered off in here. And there's also uh, some, some scheduler tools that you can run day on processing after, after hours or early in the morning. Okay. Now the uh, serial lots, there's quite a, as you can see, there's a lot here to do with serial and lot tracking. Essentially with lots there's a lot of things like quarantining if there's a problem with something you know the the, the beef or <laughs> the grain or whatever it is that's being shipped you can quarantine that and then do a recall on that lot. And we hear about that all the time on different kinds of fresh products and uh, you know so there's that. There's uh, warranties and, and registration that you can do for the customers, and there's some reconciliations that can be done. But essentially, for the most part, when we look at our items, we can look at serial numbers and lot numbers. Uh, these will pop up automatically when you're in order entry or purchase order, and you'll receive those lots or serial numbers into stock and then sell them back out. And you can see here, the receipt came in, there was a uh, receipt costs there are $15.49. And then for whatever reason, I guess the invoice came in later and it was just a little bit more than what was expected. So it added that. Now this is what we would call serial costing. And then we also have lot costing. So 
the, the advantage of that is that this cost will then follow all the way through with this serial number and then when it's sold or removed from stock it takes that full cost with it. It's uh, very accurate. Okay and then with lot numbers same thing it's just uh, that the lot numbers come in we receive them in and we can quarantine that lot we can have an expiry date so if it's fresh products or you know of some sort there's a best before date and once it passes that that date we can recall or quarantine or cancel it okay okay so the physical inventory count is located over here and you can see there is a real process here it's all in order of how you would process the first step of course is to generate the inventory worksheet and what you would do here is if you're going to do cycle counts you might just generate it only for a particular category or a particular uh, uh, picking area, picking sequence aisle, or, but if you're gonna do the whole warehouse, you have to remember to, to literally quarantine that area so that people are not removing stock and putting stock in while you're trying to count it. I, I can't remember how many, so many times that I've been helping out with physical inventory <laughs> counts and people are walking in and out with, with stock while they're trying to count it. It, it, it blows my mind, but anyway, that's how we do it. We generate the, the inventory worksheet. You can print those worksheets. You can send a PDF file to your local print and, and uh, uh, people and they can print it out for you. You can send it to the different cities that are related to these locations and have them print it and give it to the, the, the workers when they come in to pick it up and they can just go through and do their count. Now you can choose that you don't want to have the quantities show, you can choose not to show the costs. And uh, you know, the people can go around and do their count. And then you'll need to enter the quantities. Now, if you hire a temp or somebody's teenager comes in after school and they want to, you want to get them doing data entry, this quantity counts is really great because they don't see anything except for the item number, it's in the same order, the picking sequence order, and they can just enter the, the amount that is on the, the sheet. They don't actually have to really understand it. They don't have to know what they're doing. You can just put in the correct amount that was counted and away they go. And then afterwards, anybody who actually works there can come and see how that has affected things. So you can see that they've been entered some quantities here and another quantity here, and the system has identified the variance for them. Uh, if there is a problem with the cost and the, the cost variance, then these can be adjusted and you can you know, make your adjustments there. Oops. If there is an item that does not have a cost already, the system will automatically put that on hold. And that way you can go uh, post everybody else and then go and, and make your change, your adjustment to the costs and your adjustment to the quantities and then come back and post it. Of course, once you're done, there's a nice little reconciliation report. It only shows, depending what you want to do, but it only shows the ones with the variance. You can also show lot, lot and serial number variances. Uh, and so I'm just going to remove all that. And I'm going to just say only stocking unit. And that gives us a nice little report with all the details of what's being adjusted. And then we just post the inventory reconciliation. Goes in, adjusts all those quantities and costs, and then you can go in and deal with any of the, the loose ends that you're tracking. Okay. Okay, and uh, when it comes to reports, there are a lot of different kinds of reports. We've got sort of analysis reports, we've got uh, setup reports, we've got statistics and inquiries. But the, the reports that are in the stock control are probably the ones that are most important. All of these are great. Um, my personal favorite is, of course, the slow moving items. No, the inventory movement report. 
is pretty cool. And it shows us kind of a snapshot of what's happening with the different locations, uh, how many are in stock, how many are on purchase order, uh, so on. We can see inventory coming in, inventory coming out, and uh, you know it's pretty it's a pretty good report. If all you want to do is just balance it to the uh, general ledger, though, the item valuation report is the way to go. Now, there's two different variations of this report. The transaction costs report is the definitive as of a certain date report. So if we were counting this now on the 16th, but everything was dated October 31st, then of course we would put the from beginning of time until October 31st. Now this would allow us to print a report from as of that cutoff two weeks ago. Uh, the problem is that this is going to add every receipt minus every shipment plus or minus any adjustment. It can take a very long time to generate. And that's because we've backed, we're backdating. But if we use the location details report, this is real time right now. So every, something that you've done your inventory valuation and you've, you've printed your report, your, uh, sorry, you've posted your physical inventory account, you can then print this as of the uh, this moment and it will tell you what's there right now. So it's not very useful in terms of balancing it to the GL, but it is useful in terms of making sure that you have a real-time report that's accurate. And this is cool because I just did the price list against the cost, so I can see if I'm going to be, you know, off when I start selling these products. Okay. Okay. So I'm going to just uh, share the uh, the other screen again here about the questions. So if you do have any questions, uh, we will be ad addressing those in the last session today at 3.20. So just go ahead and put them into the uh, chat box. If not not right now, then catch it on the next session or you know put it in on the last session at the end. And we'll address them all individually. Okay, thanks very much for your attendance. And I'm gonna take a break now and you'll see another session. And then we're gonna come back and do the tips and tricks. Okay, thank you. Bye for now. This conference will now be recorded. Oops.